Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank all those who support the podcast by their very kind donations via either Patreon or PayPal. Those small contributions help me to put the show together for the enjoyment of all. To show my appreciation for those who support the show, I do try to deliver a few exclusive extras when I can. So, to become a patron of the World War II podcast, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast or go to ww2podcast.com and click on donate. Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. We're in North Africa in this episode of the podcast. The war in the desert was full of ups and downs for both Axis and Allies. In January 1941, Tobruk fell to the Allies. With the arrival of Rommel, the Allies were forced back and Tobruk held out under siege for seven months, depriving the Axis of a vital supply port, before being relieved as the Allies once more swept forward, only for it to fall in June 42 to Rommel. Though the British Army had expected to sacrifice Tobruk, To the public at home, it was a huge shock. The war had not been going well, not helped with the entry of Japan into the war and the fall of Singapore. It was now Churchill wanted action. He wanted good news to report to Parliament, the British people and their new allies, the USA, had entered the war. Operation Agreement was a daring raid on Tobruk in 1942, taking part with the Long Range Desert Group, the SAS, the Special Interrogations Group, the Royal Navy, the RAF, everyone was in on the act. I'm joined by John Sadler. John's book, Operation Agreement, Jewish Commandos and the Raid on Tobruk, tells the story of the operation. Thanks for joining me. I think firstly we need to set the scene in the desert. The war there was to and fro. Where were we at this time in 1942? Well, obviously the desert war has been referred to as a pendulum. Uh, which indeed it was. Now, in August, September 1942, the obviously the first battle of El Alamein and the battle of Al Anhalter had been fought. So the British and the Germans were facing each other effectively along the Alamein line, which which had been prepared um, really as early as 1940 as a kind of last ditch defence line. Um, once the had the Germans or the Axis penetrated past the Alamein line, then clearly Alexandria was very much, and the Delta was very much uh, in their sights. So the British, of course, had fallen back from, as a mature, we, we'd fallen back from the Gazala line. Uh, we'd been kicked back, actually, from the, what's it called, the Mazus Stakes and the Gazala Gallop. We, we'd retreated rather precipitately to the Al Alamein line. And then um, Okinek had seen off Rommel's uh, attack in the first battle of Al Alamein, but the British counterattacks, which we put in, as part of that battle, had not been particularly successful. So in a way, the, the British had sort of solidified along the El Alamein line. And then Rommel tried again, this time against Montgomery, and Alan Halfer had been repulsed. And in that late summer, early autumn of 1942, the British, we were building up, obviously, toward the uh, opening of the second battle of El Alamein. And Montgomery, being the cautious commander that he was, was building up his strength. The plan for operation agreement predated Montgomery's appointment, so he was able to distance himself from it. He used to say when it failed, he was vociferous in his criticism of <laughs> <laughs> but whilst it was, uh, but it was effectively a done deal before he took command, so he was able effectively to put a distance between himself and the operation. Had he been successful, one suspects it might then have all been his idea, of course. But um, He was very much like that, wasn't he? He was very clever on that, yes. He certainly wasn't. <laughs> Uh, he was more than happy to accept the plaudits, but certainly didn't want to be associated with failure. So uh, the whole idea uh, had really dated from walking next ten years, and the logic behind it was there was considerable logic behind it because clearly Rommel was suffering from and had always suffered from a chronic fuel shortage. That was the the main impediment to the the rapid advances which his tanks had made, of course. The whole, seat of, of the pendulum of the Desert War. And obviously, if a, a raid could be launched against Tobruk, which was a vital gateway in terms of Axis supplies, if those supply, if the port could be put out of action, if the fuel reserves could be destroyed, uh, then clearly that would have struck a fairly major blow against Rommel's logistics. And the Desert War was very much about logistics. So at this point, the, the, the Germans had taken Tobruk, hadn't they? Oh, yes. Yes, they took Tobruk uh, as they advanced, uh, obviously, Tobruk had been relieved during the course of uh, Operation Crusader in November to January 1941. It had, the epic siege had taken place during 1941. 
And then after the relief, as part of Operation Crusader, there was a general agreement with the British High Command that there was no point in holding Tobruk particularly. If the British had to retreat, then Tobruk could be abandoned because it wasn't. And then when it was attacked the second time, the defences had been uh, run down significantly from the Great Siege era. And then it fell virtually in the morning and 30,000 Allied troops went into the bag. It was a, a major disaster for the Allies. And of course, it had meant that the port was then in the hands of the Axis and of course could be reopened as the uh, port of embarkation on their supply line. It's I find it funny it's seen as this disaster, yet uh, you know, the high commander de- decided actually that uh, it was it it was uh, to to pull out. It, it's strange. I, do, I wonder if actually the disaster is seen by the press and not necessarily militarily. I think certainly, if I remember right, that um, Churchill received the news of the fall of Tobruk when he was negotiating uh, literally in the Oval Office, which clearly must have been a rather rather disheartening moment. And uh, it's probably measured with Churchill's greatness that he was able to soak up this particularly bad news because you're right that the, in terms of PR, in terms of propaganda, we, the Allies, had invested a great deal of propaganda effort in the garrison of Tobruk. This holding of Tobruk was seen as a great kind of Stalingrad-type position, a great success in a time when British and Allied arms in the Western Desert were not enjoying a great level of success. So there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, PR and propaganda value to Tobruk, perhaps far more than its actual military value. And obviously when it was lost, especially when so many Allied uh, servicemen passed into captivity, it was a really major be over. This is a time when the American military attaché in Cairo, Bonner Fellows, was, who was a, a pretty rabid anglophobe, was passing back all these depressing reports to uh, Washington, saying what a waste of space the British actually were, and that we, you know, we couldn't find a way out of a paper bag sort of thing. Uh, he, at the same time, was unaware, of course, that the Italians had actually uh, cracked all of his diplomatic codes, and they were reading all of these messages, I imagine, with great satisfaction. So, so, so Churchill was obviously playing to an audience in the States. Uh, but this was probably this had all been you know, before Pearl Harbor, so obviously Pearl Harbor changed everything. But up to then, of course, as you know, as you're aware, there was, a, a, there was a great reluctance, understandably, on the part of America to get involved in the war. And we knew that we needed, we could not really certainly not within any, any imaginable time scale. We had no chance of really winning the war, certainly not of reinvading mainland Europe, unless the Americans were with us. So, so the idea is to uh, make a, a, an attack by special forces um, on, on, a, on Tobruk. Now, Britain had a, a, a seemed to be developing a plethora of uh, special forces, seemed to be coming out of the desert. I wonder if you could tell us about, you know, there is quite a lot of small special forces groups that have been developed at this time. They're, they're right. They're, they're, somebody, uh, I can't remember quite who it was, described the uh, second Gulf War, or the first Gulf War that the British and Americans fought in against uh, Saddam Hussein, described Iraq as a special forces theme park. And really the, the Western Desert was a bit like that in 1940 to 42. You had people like Ralph Bagnall, of course, who'd been pre-war desert explorers, who put their very considerable expertise at the disposal of, uh, of General Wavell, of course, at that time, who jumped on Bagdell's advice and allowed him to form the Long Range Desert Group, which I think probably even now um, are arguably certainly one of the great shining examples of success in terms of Special Forces operation. Long Range Desert Group performed prodigies uh, in terms of their activities across the Western Desert. They traversed in unimaginable distances they could always uh, land where they wanted to be with pinpoint accuracy. They punched well above their weight. They were striking German bases hundreds, even a thousand miles behind the front line and duffing them up, forcing the Axis to disperse their forces. They destroyed airplanes. They gathered invaluable intelligence. So the, the Long Range Jessica was a great success story. Then, of course, you had Sterling with the SAS, which was a more – I mean, obviously, the, the LRDG always saw its role rightly as intelligence gathering – whereas the SES was simply out to biff the Germans. They were out to kill Germans. And sometimes those two objectives can, of course, be um, – are not complementary because if you're trying to gather intelligence, what you really want is that the enemy doesn't know you're there. You don't really necessarily want to knock on his front door and shoot up all his aircraft because then he's going to get the message that he's got special forces on his back door. So and then you had Popsky's private army. You had all of these various groups who uh, are all doing their own thing, as it were. But – the SES had a fairly tricky birth, I think. I mean, a lot of their early operations, whether they were being dropped by parachutes, didn't work at all. 
And then Sterling had the bright idea of working with the long range desert group. So the LRDG acted to be like as the pathfinders and the logistical arm of the SAS. They could take SAS troops and place them pretty much wherever they wanted to be. And the SAS would then, and LRDG, LRDG was certainly not shy about taking aggressive action. They would then take aggressive action against uh, German positions. And where this was done on a small unit basis, where you had limited objectives and the plan itself was quite simple and straightforward and there were not large uh, elements, various parties involved in it, then it would work. What went wrong with Operation Agreement was that it was just it just like topsy. It grew and it grew and it grew. It became far too complicated. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the one group you've not you, we've not mentioned is the uh, Special Interrogation Group. Oh, yes, I do. Yes. Well, they were they, the ITG, of course, were yet another idiosyncratic creation of the Desert War, Bertie Buck had this idea that he would recruit, and it was a brilliant idea, he would recruit, effectively, what would be Israelis, of course, after the war Zionists, who were German-speaking. These were guys who had escaped from Germany, of course, escaped Nazi, who were Jewish, escaped Nazi persecution, and who, in the first instance, were not pro-British by any means. Obviously, there were stirrings of discontent amongst uh, immigrants, Jewish immigrants into Palestine. You had the Haganah, were already formed, which became terrorist organizations, if you like, or freedom fighters, depending where you stand, after the war. But clearly, everybody realized that Germany was the common enemy to have German speakers, fluent German speakers, was a huge advantage. Now, the SIG was never a big unit, but the potential was considerable. And certainly in terms of operation agreement, they did bloody well. They didn't fail. It was the plan that was wrong. It was never the individuals who were taking part. The guys who took part in the operation showed astonishing ingenuity, gallantry, resilience, everything. It was just the plan that went wrong. Oh, it's never going to work. <laughs> did the Germans ever come up with... I mean, I wasn't, I'm not aware of it. Did the Germans ever come up with any special forces in the desert? So... The, the Italians had the Auto-Saharan Patrol, so they had, a, they had their sort of version of the long-range desert group who were primary in armoured cars, so they were more like the British Mobile Columns, Rob Collins, etc. The Germans were persuaded by Laszlo Almashi, of course, who with Bagnold had been part of the uh, Trans-Sahara exploration process in the 1930s. Laszlo Almashi, of course, becomes famous in fiction, uh, played by Ralph Fiennes in the dramatisation of the English Patient. He's the hero of that novel, but it is a novel. It doesn't bear any resemblance to history. Uh, Al-Mashi was a convinced Nazi. Uh, he would not have been interested in Kristen Scott Thomas. He was a practicing homosexual. He was an Austrian world, a Hungarian World War I air ace. He'd been a highly scoring fighter in the First World War. And he was an out-and-out Nazi and was happy to uh, throw his lot in with the Germans, uh, with Rommel. And he tried to persuade Rommel to create a long-range desert group type operation. And the Germans really, the Germans were not ever that enthusiastic about special forces. And though he did run one mission, he ran agents into the Delta. He crossed the desert and took agents into Delta, which, of course, uh, formed a, the basis of another novel, this time by Ken Fogg, Keith Rebecca. And that really was the only mission that he ever undertook. And Rommel wasn't that impressed. So the idea of Axis special forces never really got off the ground. It's funny. Isn't it? I wonder if it's a strange individual individualism. That's... I think it is. It's a fact. Yes, it is. it's about individualism. The fact that the British Army, as ever, threw up this eclectic cast of characters. Um, who, and I think the German Army couldn't have coped with people like that. They just couldn't cope with the sheer maverick eccentricity of people like Bagnold, who really were just going to do their own thing anyway. And it was, it was, a, it was a wise commander-in-chief like Weibull who pretty much gave them, the, you know, gave them their head and said, right, okay, guys, it's a big desert. Go out and play. And, um, they, and to be fair, they, they brought home the big and they delivered the results. And I think it's part of the, I think it's part of the British mindset as opposed to the German mindset, that we can do this whole special forces thing. I think the Germans are probably not, they're not wired up the same way. They, they have a different view of it. Obviously, Rommel was a brilliant commander. The Africa Corps was a superb uh, army, a, uh, a superb fighting force. But again, they were really focused on being conventional soldiers rather than special forces. Mm. Mm. So where did the you know, the idea of attacking with special forces, why with special forces, why, why not... Uh... Send Seventh Armoured or uh, you know a conventional unit to try and uh, oust the Germans. Yeah, that would have been impossible because of the distance they would have had to travel. They'd have been completely exposed, first exposed, especially to access uh, attack from the air, 
and really any column, any armoured column that was sent out, and this is something Ord Wingate had recommended when the LRDG was formed. Wing, Ord Wingate wanted a much a heavier type of unit with tanks and guns and you know, effectively a, a mobile column. The fact is a mobile column would never be strong enough to take on the Africa Corps. You'd be picked up pretty quickly once you crossed the, assuming you had to punch your way through the German defensive crust. And then your chances of going to Tobruk alive would be almost uh, negligible. The beauty of Heseldon's plan, the original plan, was that the Germans would never think that the Long Range Desert Group could actually cover nearly 2,000 miles of desert under their noses and bluff their way, using the SIGs, into this heavily defended uh, fortress city, which was Tobruk. It was. The, the original idea was brilliant. But, but the, the, the original plan was limited. Um and it grew. It it grew. Did it? Did the objectives grow with it? I mean, how did it grow? The yeah, Hesel had this idea. It was a limited raid. LRDG were and SAR and uh, the command Middle East commanders would launch a raid. They would cross the desert. They would come effectively from the south through through Sea Oasis. They would approach the defences of Tobruk with the British troops, apparently as POWs, guarded by the SIGs, who would be in Africa for uniform. So this would look like a pretty routine transfer of prisoners. Obviously, the SIG were all fluent German speakers. Uh, they, they they never spoke any other language. They, carried, they wore German uniforms. They carried German weapons. They were well versed in Africa Corps discipline and uh, tactics. So they could and did pass muster as Africa Corps. So effectively, they would enter the defended perimeter by stealth, and then they would blow up the fuel reserves and then get the hell out. That was simple as that. That was the whole objective. And then uh, once Middle East Command saw this, oh, well, you know, this is a great opportunity. We could, we can build on this. We can actually destroy the entire infrastructure of the port if we land Marines uh, on one flank, have the long range desert group and the commanders on the other flank. If we soften the whole thing up with a massive air raid to start with, which of course, actually all that ever did was wake the Germans up, then we can do great things. And really, it was just the whole thing grew like topsy. And it's this all sort of mission creep thing. Nobody ever, it was like the Emperor's New Clothes. Nobody ever turned around and said, well, hang on, guys, is this actually going to work? The whole thing, Arnhem perhaps being a, a very good example on a larger scale, it assumed a momentum of its own. And anybody who expressed doubts was then branded as a heretic. I, I find the adding of the uh, C element a bit almost peculiar because it, it, it's quite a big thing to get people onto the land. You know, it's... It's almost as if there were, if there's political pressure to to make it into a big event, uh, rather which overrides practicalities. Yes, that's exactly what happened. It be, the whole thing. Uh, a lot of people then invest their um, their credibility, if you like, in the operation, and therefore uh, nobody actually turns around and says, "Look, guys, can we just sit down and really think about this? Is it actually going to work or not?" And the tragedy was, of course, it, it meant that many Marines lost their lives, many were captured. And a number of very fine ships uh, were lost, and their crews, those who survived, became prisoners. So uh, the cost of the failure was pretty high by any standards. And yet, in many ways, both the Navy and the Marines did pretty well. But the whole thing was flawed because the landing craft, which were to deliver the Marines, were shoddily put together. They were jerry-built boats. The Marines had that time to practice for them efficiently, certainly not in a, in a swell had they done so, then they hold the deficiencies of these craft thrown together in the element, and they just weren't fit for purpose. And if that's the case, then you're not going to get anywhere. The whole thing was, was flawed from the start. And obviously then when the submarine failed to, well, well, the submarine couldn't discharge its commanders when they were not able to actually identify the proper landing beach, then it was just going to get worse and worse. You, you've mentioned that the, uh, the bombers went in first. Uh, and woke everyone up. Yet, yet the land assault by the Long Range Desert Group and the SIG went very well, didn't it? They, they captured. Did they? They captured their objectives. What were their objectives? Their objectives were to knock out the guns on one flank of the attack, and uh, what would be the eastern flank of the attack, and that would allow additional troops to be brought in by MTB. Uh, they would uh, light a landing curve, as a sky after the curve, and a number of uh, Fermars and MTBs would land additional troops. They would knock out the gun batteries on that side of the of the port, hold them for as long as it was required. By the time the Marines had then dismantled the port facilities, everybody would then be taken off. And what went wrong was that the MTBs couldn't get in 
the lighting wasn't sufficient. They, they couldn't find the cove. And then, of course, very quickly, the sun was coming up and they found themselves under fire. And really, MTBs were not suitable vessels for taking troops. They were light craft. They were fast raiders. They were not there as troop transport. And in many ways, they were also floating bombs. They are full of fuel. So if you slow down, somebody, you know, somebody puts in a sentry at the fuel tank, well, that's it. You know, you're finished. Uh, and, and the reality was that in daylight, they wouldn't have air cover. They would not have air cover, which meant if they, you know, if you were at sea within range of access planes in daylight, you were going to be bounced. Well, the first one was uh, the SBS via possible inflatable dinghies. What was their objective? The, their objective, quite simply, was to land uh, in dinghies, uh, four boats, from uh, submarine Taku and mark out the landing beaches. So they were to put out lights, marker lights, which would have been obvious to the destroyers and to the commanders, the marine commanders on the destroyers, which would enable the landing craft to steer into the right beach. So so they failed, but they also failed to tell the incoming landing craft that they'd, they'd not achieved that, that. A communication breakdown between the submarine uh, Middle East Command and uh, the two destroyers, Sink and Zulu, meant that that message was not relayed. The submarine commander hadn't been fully briefed and therefore he didn't understand. Not his fault, he just didn't quite grasp how vital the role of his submarine and the guys he was carrying was in the mission. Had he understood that, uh, then clearly he might have either made more effort or been more strenuous in saying, look, hang on, guys, you know, we just can't do this. This isn't going to happen. So it, they met the commanders, then went in blind. On one beach. The command, they, they still uh, uh, try, try to go in with, with the aid of two destroyers. Now, which come in quite close, which also seems an incredible thing because you know, presumably the Germans had guns pointing out to sea. Oh, God, yeah, lots of them. Yeah, big ones. 88. <laughs> you think of a destroyer. I mean, the, the destroyer packs a certain amount of firepower, but the whole purpose of a destroyer is as a fast, a fast, hard-hitting vessel. It's not there like a monitor or a battleship to swap fire with shore batteries. The destroyer is just not armoured against 88 millimeter shells. It's a sitting duck when it starts sitting there in the water, especially with the sun coming up nicely behind it. You know, it's, it's perfectly uh, lit up. It's it's literally, it's just, as as indeed proved to be the case, it's a sitting duck. And I think it's also worth you know, pointing out that when people are thinking of landing craft, you know, we're not th- talking Higgins boats from later in the war. We're just we're talking boats with bows. You have to land them and jump over the side. So deployment of those is is slow going. They're like unwieldy clumsy longboats with outboard engines effectively and only some of them are motorized therefore the ones with the engines have to tow the others so if the rope snaps you are you're left drifting and because of the high freeboard on the uh, landing vessels you couldn't row you could rely on the tide to take you in i mean it, you know, it's the sort of thing you, you just say you wouldn't start from here let's put it like that it was a if it hadn't been for the loss of life it would have been almost comic but it wasn't because obviously so many guys were killed and injured it does seem strange to think that, you know, they had no, if they're cut free for whatever reason, those boats are just left to the mercy to bob about either, you know, at the mercy of the tide going in or, or disappearing out into the med. Of course, the sun was rising by this time. So um, the German gunners really uh, had a field day. And of course, if you are lightly armed troops, the best of heavy sweat you're going to have is a brain gun. Well, that's not going to help you against the 88. The land troops, the, 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 the long red desert group uh, uh, and the land assault, they did they manage to uh, withdraw? A number of them did, because what had happened was that they had become spread out in order to take their objectives, to knock out the German guns, which inevitably proved to be a lot more German and Italian guns, which proved to be a lot more numerous than had been suspected. Uh, they ran into more opposition than had been suspected. And what had not been considered was how strong the German and Italian garrison actually was. The estimates of how strong the garrison was, you know, the, the classic mistake, it's just a bunch of old men and boys. Well, it wasn't. The Germans had a highly efficient, highly responsive garrison with reinforcements to hand. And the commanders, having knocked out the guns on their flanks, suddenly found themselves counterattacked by large numbers of fresh German troops. And they eventually were pushed back and back and back until they were forced into a defensive perimeter around this headquarters building in the as it was called, uh, where eventually the survivors were forced to capitulate. The long-range desert group were actually sitting outside the perimeter at that time. Their objective was to knock out a, a radar station, but they had, right from the outset, lost radio contract with the commanders. Their job, yes, was to pick up the commanders and get them out, but nobody ever got out. Nobody got out. Uh, the SI, a few of the SIG got out. Some guys got out along the coast, but effectively the whole force 
uh, most of them eventually we ran, literally ran out of ammunition. Most were were captured. I mean, the SIG. Surely, they, did did any of them that were captured survive the war? That would be. Uh... Uh, well, obviously they had uh, what they've been told. Change uniform. Change uniform. Yeah, and they had false uh, dog tags as well. So obviously, if you were captured, and if you obviously know to be a German Jew, well, that was it. So one would take to one would take to Auschwitz. In fact, several, quite a few of them actually managed. A number of them got out, and those that were captured, so prior, amazingly, providentially. Uh, were just accepted and went into the bag as Allied POWs. Yeah, because that was one thing I did wonder what, you know, you, you would presumably hide your Jewishness very quickly if you were uh, yes. <laughs> captured. British servicemen, British Jewish servicemen were all given false IDs. They got false dog tags with anglicised names because it was known. I mean, obviously, the full horror of the concentration camps wasn't appreciated, but we knew that what the Germans would like to do to Jews and how they felt about Jewish people. And therefore, clearly, an allied Jewish serviceman might uh, very well might suffer uh, particularly savage treatment at the hands of the Germans. Therefore, our uh, Jewish guys, because many guys who served were Jewish, were given um, anglicised or false, effectively false IDs. So it would just be a normal Tommy if they were captured. Well, in fact, in, in fact Rommel, was not, Rommel was not a rampant Nazi in that sense. Um, given that his aide-de-camp at Berlin was a Jew anyway, uh, it was uh, he was perhaps... Certainly not on the fanatical Nazi mode. Of course, once these guys passed into captivity, well, then they were completely vulnerable. So it's not just the human life, but what I found incredible about what what is essentially a raid uh, is actually the loss of shipping. The Royal Navy lose three ships. Yes, yeah, three capital ships and a number of the FMRs and MTBs. So Sikh and Zulu uh, are lost. The right cruiser is lost. And I think uh, six or seven of the MTBs and FMRs are lost. And obviously that represents a significant loss in terms of not just loss of life, but a guys from Sikh and Zulu who um, become a Zulu, a Sikh certainly, most of those who survive are made prisoner. So it represents a loss. And these were tribal class destroyers. They were a very important part of the Mediterranean squadron. They were predominantly taken out from uh, shore batteries? In the course of the attack, Sikh took tremendous punishment and uh, lost way, lost her engines, everything else, and was effectively a sitting duck. She was shot to pieces. Zulu tried to tow her, but it was improved impossible. And uh, Zulu was obliged to abandon sea, effectively wallowing just off the shore. And eventually the ship went down, the crew took to the boats. Uh, Zulu made a run for it, of course, and that was really the second part of the tragedy. The company was lost trying to rescue Zulu. Zulu seemed to get clear, and then just, you know, within almost within miles of being out of the range of the Axis uh, bombers, she took a couple of direct hits from Axis bombs and she went down as well. So really, it was, the, it was the, uh, the the main loss was affected by Axis planes flying from Crete. It, it, it's hard to find anything to say that it was a su- su- success. Did did just everything go wrong? Yes, basically. I mean, it wasn't the fault of the individual. It's quite the opposite. I mean, the guys took part, showed incredible courage. Uh, in terms of the, you could not say that the soldiers had failed. They didn't. They did their duty, and they did it magnificently. And they suffered horrific losses as a consequence. The commanders on the beach, in spite of everything, got ashore and fought their way onto the beach and fought their way up off the beach because then they were just left isolated in a hostile hinterland with no hope of, no hope of rescue, no hope of resupply. And the survivors uh, all went into the bag. So it must have been incredibly disheartening for these guys. But everything that they'd done, all the training that they had uh, undertaken, the way they'd keyed their hopes up for this operation and the courage and uh, tremendous stamina which they'd shown in fighting their way ashore. So in terms of the the performance of the troops, they could not be faulted. The Navy could not be faulted. It was the plan that was wrong. And as we know, if, it, if the plan is wrong, all the courage and all the uh, steadfastness in the world won't, unfortunately, ensure a victory. What was fundamentally wrong with the plan? There's a, there's a, there's a, a principle in art and special forces called KISS, which is keep it simple, stupid. And that's what we didn't do. The Americans didn't do the Americans never learned that. You think of what went wrong in, in Somalia and other places with America and Iran with American special forces operations in the post war period was that they, they were just too complicated. If you want a special forces job to succeed, keep it as simple as possible and limit your objectives. Uh, there, there was a sister raid on Benghazi at about the same time. Did that fare any better or was that the same? Yes, not really. No, uh, that was the SAS was to carry out the raid in Benghazi. And the SAS were halted short of the perimeter. And Sterling, quite wisely, realizing that the surprise had gone, also abandoned the operation. The only successful 
of these September raids, the only one which achieved any measure of success, was a classic raid by the LRDG on the uh, pr- primarily Italian-held uh, Effie and Basse. So the, the, the uh, longish desert group did what they always did. They crossed the vast amount of desert. They slipped into the town and seen. They shot the hell out of the town. They destroyed God knows how many aircraft. They killed an awful lot of Italians. And such was the brava, bravo of the, uh, of the longish desert group. And when they were confronted by Italian tanks, they rammed the tanks with their jeeps. Just literally drove the jeeps into these tanks. And that was enough to discourage the tanks. So, yeah, uh, and, and they got out. They got out uh, with, I mean, they, they, were, they lost a few, quite a few vehicles uh, to air attack on the way back. But their casualties uh, were remarkably light. And the damage which they inflicted on the Axis uh, was quite significant. And, of course, every successful raid like that means the enemy is forced, not only does he have to deal with the losses, he's forced to send more troops to reinforce his position because he realizes that these positions however far in the rear of his front line they appear to be, are still vulnerable. That's the genius of the long-range desert group. It's not just the damage that they do, it's the logistical effect that it forces Rommel to spread his defences even thinner than they already are, and to commit men and materiel to defending his rear areas, which of course otherwise would be deployed in the front line. Now, of the September raids, only the, 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 the raid which was solely carried out by the long-range desert group, their classic, you know, get in fast, Shoot the hell out of the place, get out fast. The, the classic, real first class special forces um, type action was a great success. A- Admiral Harwood claimed it was better to have tried and failed than not to have tried at all. What do you think? Well, he wasn't the man who was actually trying. Uh, I think anybody who's stuck on Sikh or Zulu or left on that bloody beach or left on the headland might have disagreed with him. Obviously, he's putting a brave face on it, he's, he's giving the PR version. And in war, you would say, well, you know, if you don't, you're bound to fail if you don't try. And if you, you will never win unless you try. Having said that, I think Operation Agreement was a bad idea. It was a bad plan. It was a bad plan which was badly planned. It wasn't thought through. It wasn't analyzed. Nobody sat down and did a SWOT analysis on the plan, thinking, taking an objective view and thinking, hang on, can we actually do this? Or have we um, got actually beyond the bounds of possibility, which it had? So I really don't think it has. It has, and again, I'm not in any way detracting from the courage and tremendous achievement of the individual fighting men, the Long Range Desert Group achievement in getting across that much of that much desert without being spotted, of getting heavily armed British commanders through a well defended German perimeter using, uh, in fact, what would be Israelis dressed up as Africa Corps convincingly was a, a real coup. It was a major feat. Had they just done that, had they destroyed fuel reserves and then got the hell out, everybody would have said it was a great success. But uh, and had it been left at that, then the story of Operation Agreement would have been very different. But as it was, with the scale of the raid, I don't think anything really justifies it. I think it was a bad idea. It was a bad idea. It was easy to be wise with hindsight, but it was wrong. How was it reported back in Britain? It got lost off very quickly because remember this is September. And virtually a month later, the second battle of El Alamein opened, which was obviously a very hard fought, uh, very tough battle. But the end of course, El Alamein turned into a great British victory. So it just got forgotten about. It was swept under the carpet. It's the end of a trilogy, really, of of, of raids in forty two because there's the San Azen raid in uh, March, Dieppe in August, and this is September. Well, San Jose, I think, did they did at least manage to blow the ship, but that was hardly... Um... Your class is a, a conditional success, I think. Dieppe obviously was a disaster, an unequivocal disaster. On the other hand, as Van Betten said, there were valuable lessons learned from Dieppe, which informed us when it came to mounting Operation Overlord. But again, you might say that those limitations on uh, Operation Jubilee were bloody obvious, really. And did you have to lose all those men to find out the bleeding obvious. Think of how, you know, the Canadian troops, who were obviously the, who were the, the main force attacking, they suffered terrible losses. Again, not through lack of courage, not through lack of resolve, quite the opposite. They were extremely courageous, but the plan was just a bad one, and it didn't work. It did make me think, because this is you know, not, not dissimilar from an amphibious point of view. No, it's not. Well, there are similarities, yes. There are similarities. And 12 months later, you've got Operation Husky, which is probably the first Allied amphibious uh, landing. Uh, it does. I, I, I've never really been able to square the circle of what uh, what was learnt from from them. I think 
uh, for Husky because Husky hair was problematic in itself. Oh yes, it was. It was I mean, any amphibious operation obviously is fraught with, with problems. What I think was realised through Operation Jubilee was firstly he didn't send the men ashore in plywood landing craft. That's the first thing. Secondly, he made sure the tanks can actually run on the bloody beach before you put them on the beach. Uh, that's, you can't, there's no point in putting tanks onto a shingle beach and wondering why they just stand still because they can't move. Uh, also, that and and what there was some success in Jubilee. The, the commander, the, the commander attacks on the German batteries on the bluffs above the port were successful. So that was that that part of the operation. Uh, one of my uncles by marriage took part was a success. But the fact was that everything about the the naval bombardment for Jubilee was inadequate. The, all the air raid, again, the air raid was inadequate, and all it did was work up the German defense, the fact they're about to be attacked. I mean, you don't have to be the keenest tactical brain in the Wehrmacht to realize that if you're being attacked from the air, that probably at a port, probably something nasty is about to happen from the sea. So um, for D-Day, obviously, you realize that the bombardment, the aerial bombardment had to carry a much greater weight. The naval bombardment had to carry greater weight, and the men had to be got ashore in a far uh, less exposed manner, hence you've got Hobart's funnies, uh, which again, you know, to be fair, whatever it says about Hobart and his funnies, they did work, they did the job. Hobart did bring home the bacon. And Montgomery, of course, he, he were very, very careful to make sure that the sand, the sand composition of the D-Day beaches would take the weight of a, of a medium tank. So, yes, there were lessons learned from these, which, and if one looks at Husky, then one looks at uh, Overlord, probably the most complicated and the largest amphibious operation ever undertaken in this warfare, the lessons of, or the failure of uh, Jubilee, the failure of agreement, certainly did, to an extent, inform the success of subsequent operations. Uh, that's great. I think we've given a whistle-stop tour of agreement. <laughs> um, I'll put a link to John's book, Operation Agreement, Jewish Commandos and the Raid on Tobruk on the website. If you visit John's website, johnsadler.net, you'll find links to other historical stuff John does in and around the northeast of England and his other published works. So that's it for this episode. As ever, don't forget to check out the Facebook page for various World War II related bits and bobs. And if you want a bit more and don't get carried away, it is just a bit more from time to time. You can support the show on Patreon or check out the website for details. www.podcast.com Com. Until next time, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.